but this is what I want to.
go down when they come. in welcoming the great form of 
this morning, I was talking to Dr. Reyes, who had some guests from uh, abroad. And these archaeologists said, when you walk around this campus, you feel the sense of and the weight of American history. But today, we are enjoying being part of that long tradition in history. And we start by welcoming all those who joined. And there is someone who deserves a special welcome. Our longest serving and longest tenured retiring legend who has served the school with distinction for 43 years. Before we celebrate this form, let us give a, a sound round of applause. Ms. Lincoln, please. Thank you. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our sixth headmaster, Bill Polk. And <laughs> to former president of the Gordon School Board of Trustees and member of the form of 1957, Gordon Gand. <laughs> and to all the trustees, distinguished guests, as they say, uh, protocol observed. I begin this segment of our Prize Day ceremony by introducing, really, the current president, board president, Ben Pine, a graduate of the form of 1977, and a parent of two sons who know the circle very well. Graduates, Gordon, 12, and Britain, 15. But most importantly, Janet Pine, who tells him exactly what to do. Mr. Pine assumed his duties as president of the board in 2020. Mr. Pine, the podium is yours. Temba, thank you very much. It is uh, wonderful to be here, of course. On behalf of all my trustees, all my fellow trustees, I would, wel I would like to welcome all of you here in person to the Groton School Commencement Day for the form of 2023. Now, as the class was walking in, I could sense a certain level of excitement in this tempt, and I hope it also warmed everybody up. I think, um, as we all know, it takes a village to, su to support each and every one of us through our formative years. And I would like to ask you, the form of 2023, to rise and to turn around and to thank all of your parents, faculty, staff that are here today who helped you get through Groton. I think a loud cheer, please. <laughs> and while you're standing, I think we also should, and I think would encourage everyone to give a loud round of applause in honor of the Macobellas, who are celebrating their 10th year and 10th commencement. You can sit now. You're welcome to stand, but I think you'll be more comfortable. So as a longtime Grotonian, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you this morning from an older graduate's perspective. The first is around friendships, relationships, and the importance and value of both of them through life. The friendships and relationships that one creates around this circle really do last a lifetime. It may not always seem evident right now or in the few years after you graduate, 
But I can tell you from my own experience that we have all made friends on this campus for life who will be there for us in good times and through the challenging times. I have seen it firsthand. I see it in our two sons and the incredible friendships that they built here. And I'm fortunate to see it at reunions and at the many alumni events that I get to go to. It is palpable. And rest assured that those relationships extend well beyond your form to, your other, to the other forms, to the great faculty and staff here, and certainly to the Machabellas. So please embrace, relish, and enjoy these friendships. I know they will stand you in good stead in all the years ahead. We all need each other, and in the words of the Japanese author Ryusunuke Satoru, individually we are one drop, but together we are an ocean. That is true here and also very true in life beyond this circle. The next thought is to share a story with you that I heard in my early 20s when I was involved in the classical music world. I confess it's a little nerdy, so I apologize, but I think relevant for today. It goes something like this. Jerry was visiting his whole neighborhood in the West Village of New York and bumped into one of his oldest friends, Tom, whom he hadn't seen in over 25 years. Growing up, they were inseparable and used to play in elementary and high school and then a local jazz band, Jerry being a clarinetist, Tom a trumpeter. In his early 20s, Jerry decided to leave the village and see what else he could do with his talents and interests. After the formalities, Tom asked Jerry, what has he been up to? So Jerry starts to telling him about his life's journey. So Jerry starts, well, you know, I left to join a traveling band and got to travel throughout the States and then around the world. We even cut a few albums that were top sellers. Tom responds, really? I didn't know about that. By the way, I don't think Jerry ever went to a reunion. Jerry continues, I had an interest in doing more than just playing, so I decided to try my luck at writing music, and I moved out to the West Coast. Unfortunately, things were pretty bleak and dark for a few years when nothing seemed to work and I had to do all sorts of odd jobs to get by. But then almost when I was going to give up, one of my songs was picked up and produced. Oh, I didn't hear about that. And then you wouldn't believe it, but another producer asked if I should try my hand at writing music for a film. And that's what I started doing. Really? Wow, I never heard about that either. And you wouldn't believe it, but my latest score was nominated for an Oscar. That's terrific. I never heard about that either. And then after a pause, Tom, asks, well, what brings you back here to the old neighborhood? Well, as part of the publicity tour for the film, I had to be in New York, and since I was here, I thought I'd stop by and see if I could play some, some pieces, a gig with some of the old band, member, band members. So how did that go? Well, Jerry says, to tell you the truth, I'm pretty rusty because I've been composing, and I didn't play very well at all. Tom responds, oh, yeah, I know. I certainly heard about that. <laughs> I heard that story 40 years ago and for the longest time thought it was a lesson on humility and the truth in life that people often only remember what you did last or especially what you did wrong. As we all know, there's a lot of Monday, quarter, Monday morning quarterbacking that goes on in this life. As a performer at the time, it pushed me to continue to practice and hone my skills, expand my repertoire, and always try to make the next performance better than the last. And it pushed me no matter what I did later in life and in my career. And I would say the same push for excellence is true for an athlete, doctor, teacher, executive, or really anyone. Continuous learning and continuous improvement are attitudes that propel each of us forward and make our lives richer, both personally and professionally. So there certainly is a learning in that reading of the story. However, more recently, I began to focus on the other guy, Tom, and the juxtaposition of the two characters in the story. Why was he content in staying in the village and not see more of the world or even country? Was he not curious or want to expand his horizons? Was he scared he might make a mistake or be a flop? So to me, the story is just as much about curiosity and courage as it is about striving for excellence. Charles Schultz, the creator of the famous comics, com, uh, Peanuts comic strip, once said, life is like a 10-speed bike. Most of us have gears we never use. As Groton graduates, I'm not particularly worried about your lack of curiosity as the education you have received here gives you the tools and foundation to continue a lifelong journey of inquiry, learning, and a fantastic foundation in experiencing all parts of the world that we inhabit. And from my experience, the opportunity to visit, live, and work in other locations, whether in this country or outside, 
will enrich your life and create ever-expanding relationships. But curiosity goes beyond just travel. I will never forget during a mentoring session held by the then head of ESPN, George Bodenheimer, when someone asked him his advice on how to be successful. His simple and very humble answer was, always be curious. He then went on to discuss how he not only read the relevant information about his direct business, but also dug deep into other areas so he could learn and develop new ways of thinking, new ideas, and new perspectives that would ultimately help him lead his team better and explore new opportunities. He was never satisfied with the status quo or business as usual. That attitude of curiosity led to unprecedented success for ESPN while he was president. We can all learn from that, of course, and then going back to that Charles Schultz quote a long time ago, when there were 10 speed, bi 10 speed bikes, bikes today, of course, as you know, have over 20 gears. So just think of all those additional gears we all can explore and use. While curiosity is important, having the courage to follow that curiosity or pursue a new interest, even if it leads to making mistakes or failing, is equally important. Why was Tom, the other guy, content in staying in his very comfortable world? If it was because he didn't want to take a chance or was scared to make a mistake, I think we all get that on some level. Going back to the story, if all people are going to remember is your last effort or what you did wrong, why would you ever want to put yourself out there? I believe that that is the quandary that we all face constantly in our lives. Trying something new does not guarantee success, but it does guarantee learning, and growing. Jerry had the courage and conviction to try something new, was open to making mistakes. He weathered some tough times, yet as you hear, he ended up okay. The more we push, the more we learn, and the more we grow. And I know you all experience that here as Groton. As Albert Einstein once said, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. And even a little courage or conviction goes a long way. Having the courage to do or to try is what, important, is what is important. Doing is how we make a difference in our own lives as well as in all those around us. As I'm sure you've heard from many, life is very much of a marathon. Today is an important mile marker in that marathon. But rest assured there is so much more out there for each of you to explore, to learn from, and to grow from. Each of us has the power to write our own stories please always be open to using that power to write your story. Be curious, have the courage and conviction to follow that curiosity to see where it may lead, and always strive for excellence in whatever you pursue. As graduates of this institution, you have a very incredible, strong foundation to spring from, as well as an amazing set of friendships and relationships to support you along your journey as you continue to explore and grow in ways that we haven't even imagined yet. How exciting for all of us. Congratulations to each of you. Go well and the very best in all that you do. The triumphant form of 2023. I'll say that again. The triumphant form of 2023. Here they are. <laughs> Throughout the country, the forms of 2023 are celebrated for succeeding despite the interruptions caused by the pandemic. What is unique? about the Groton Forum of 2023 is how they embraced these challenges, viewing them as opportunities. This is why, in my mind, they will always be known and remembered in this school as the form that awakened to their responsibilities. They triumphed over so much adversity and in so doing, brought Groton back to its honored traditions. Groton has a long established tradition of seeing the silver lining in gloomy skies. This form triumphed over the shadow that COVID cast over their most formative years. They pressed the reset button 
to teach the underformers some of Groton's most important and enduring traditions. At sit-down dinners, I watched with pride and admiration as the dining hall prefects dutifully demonstrated to the youngsters that fine dining is enhanced by neatly set tables replete with exquisitely laid out white tablecloths. One of these prefects had a habit of assembling the servers to show them an example of a table that was perfectly set. Those were moments of triumph in the dining hall. I have a tradition also of inviting seniors, it's my tradition in my 10th year, to schedule meetings to have tea with me in the headmaster's office. I don't usually have takers. This year, three boys from three continents took me up on it. We would have fine tea in Groton cups and we would just celebrate being together. And I acknowledge them for starting this new tradition. And then there were the five girls who often visited to raise my spirits, great conversationalists. These students were comfortable coming to the headmaster's office often to just brighten my day. And always, they would help themselves to some candy <laughs> on their way out. No gossip allowed, just ideas, dreams, and sharing moments of triumph. Now, some of the moments of triumph often almost got some of the small exuberant ones into hot soup. <laughs> A few boys felt one chapel at Groton was not enough and built a chapel behind the gym. <laughs> and and they consecrated it as St. Stephen's Chapel. I'm told that they also went through the process of being ordained. <laughs> Their purpose was to, lead, was to brag that ours was the only school with not only one but two chapels. I'm happy to report that despite a brief existence online, Groton St. Stephen's Chapel is no more. I will never know how they managed to get bricks, cement, and a truck to do this. <laughs> but I gather that at 3 a.m., they got tired and they wanted a place to sleep. <laughs> Finally, at the end of the winter term, a student came running to me. This was in 2020. And he said, quote, Mr. Marcobella, my friends at home were online for two terms. I thank the school for opening in September of 2020. That student is graduating today. This is indeed a form of graduates who triumphed over adversity and they did not forget to say thank you. So do we, we thank you. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the sixth form class speaker who was elected by his peers. Elected, I suspect, because of his association with positivity or nucleophilicity, embracing so much that God has to offer. Will, please take the podium. Good morning, Mr. and Mrs. Machabella, Mr. Meacham, trustees, faculty, family, friends, senior prefects, admissions prefects, <laughs> DNI prefects, <laughs> literary society heads, two sport varsity captains, and field hockey managers. I'm going to be completely honest with all of you. I've been enjoying my senior spring and heavily slacking off with my work ethic, so it is entirely my fault 
that I wrote almost all of this between the hours of 3 and 8 this morning while Googling marine biology facts for fun. So if none of this makes sense and I start rambling on about starfish or something, I mean, I guess you just kind of have to deal with that. But I'll try to keep this brief, since today is a big day. The big day. And you all have a lot to do. You've got to thank the faculty and staff here who have helped us all so much to learn and to grow. You've got to thank the family members who have sacrificed so much for us to be here. And you've got to thank your friends and tell them you love them. What else is there to do? You have to sit here and pretend to care about who wins all the prizes for best use of the library by a third former. <laughs> and you need to... <laughs> And you need to give a few hundred hugs, handshakes, and uncomfortable one-armed side hugs, all while pretending you know any of the fourth formers. <laughs> and you have to listen to the powerful, inspiring words of Mr. Pine and Mr. Machabella, and a distinguished, charismatic, and highly intelligent Prize Day speaker, and John Meacham. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. I'm not actually any of those things. And as a result, I'm honestly not that qualified to be up here preaching wisdom or advice to all of you, because I'm really just not that smart. I mean, I was smart enough to get into Groton, and hopefully to make it out too. But <laughs> in all honesty, I don't know if I'm actually any smarter than I was when I came here. Don't get me wrong, I've certainly gained some knowledge and a bit of skill at thinking, but I'm not sure how much direct measurable improvement upon the trajectory of my growth as a person or as a student since coming here there's been, or at least enough improvement to quantifiably justify four years and massive amounts of tuition costs and being far away from my parents. And I think the same could be said for a lot of my fellow graduates today and a lot of the students here in general. But truthfully, the only real learning we've done here is about ourselves and each other and how to be good to one another. And I want to try to explain why I think that's okay before all the parents start asking the school about a refund. <laughs> to do that, I'd like to tell you all a story, perhaps a little history lesson of sorts. And I'll try to recount it as clearly and faithfully as I can. But if not, I'll just cross my fingers and hope there aren't any Pulitzer Prize winning historians here to show me up. <laughs> it's so awkward. Um, <laughs> It's a story that's been told and retold many times, and I'm sure some of you have heard a version of it before. But as far as I can tell from a thoroughish search of the internet, its or origin is largely, largely attributed to a poet named Lauren Isley. Once upon a time, there was a wise man who used to go to the ocean to do his writing. He had a habit of walking on the beach before he began his work. One day, as he was walking along the shore, he looked down the beach and saw a human figure moving like a dancer. He smiled to himself at the thought of someone who had danced for the sea. And so he walked f faster to catch up. As he got closer, he noticed that the figure was that of a young man, and that what he was doing was not dancing at all. The young man was reaching down to the shore, picking up small objects and throwing them into the ocean. He came closer still and called out, Good morning, young man. May I ask what it is you are doing? The young man paused, looked up, and replied, I'm throwing starfish into the ocean. I must ask then, why are you throwing starfish into the ocean? Asked the somewhat startled wise man. To this, the young man replied, well, the sun is up and the tide is going out, and if I don't throw them in, they'll die. Upon hearing this, the wise man commented, but young man, do you not realize that there are miles and miles of beach and there are starfish all along every mile? There are so many, you can't possibly make a difference. At this, the young man bent down, picked up yet another starfish, and threw it into the ocean. As it met the water, he said, it made a difference to that one. I know what you're all thinking. He actually is talking about starfish. <laughs> Once again, deal with it. But I think this story is relevant to the story of the kids graduating today and our time here at Groton. 
It's a story about someone who chooses to go up against an unstoppable force with unflinching resolve. And it's a story of two people, an observer and an actor. And the hero of the story is the one who chooses to act by jumping in with no hesitation to try to make the world a better place. I don't know if any of us have changed the world yet, but we have been asked again and again to do the impossible and to make a difference when it seems like nothing we do matters at all. In fact, I would argue that's the point of Groton. We average between 15 and 20 hours of classes a week on top of five hours homework per night for us sixth formers, on top of about 10 hours, if you're lucky, of athletic or artistic commitments in the afternoon. That's about 60 hours a week of Groton, without including dorm duty, check-ins, and other student leadership duties. We have a one-day weekend, and we spend that day doing homework. Fulfillment is impossible. Burnout is inevitable. And that isn't a complaint. It's just a fact. This school feeds us and looks after us and gives us the nicest possible place in which to do any of this. So it's not like it's super hard or painful or unfortunate. It's quite the opposite. We often look and feel like we're dancing, but at the end of the day, we're still endlessly throwing starfish. We're just trying to get an impossible amount of stuff done in an amount of time we don't have. But we managed to figure it out anyway. And we figure out how to make it fun. No matter what we do, right or wrong, we choose to go beyond observing from the sidelines and instead actively participate in the world of Groton. As I sought last night to participate in Groton one more time by trying to write something I hope my classmates might enjoy, I found my way to the heart of the starfish area of the internet, landing on a quote from the most famous sea star of them all, Patrick from the award-winning series SpongeBob. <laughs> Deep in the throes of season four, in a teary-eyed confession to his best friend, Patrick says, knowledge can never replace friendship. I'd rather be an idiot. This is, if you read it literally, a stupid quote. <laughs> and it's from a show that many of you probably think is stupid. But if we're honest with ourselves, at the end of the day, every one of us identifies with this idea of how lovely it can be to share a moment of joy with someone just as dumb and crazy as you. And I hope that you, my formates, know how much I've appreciated your stupidity, the good, fun kind, at least, during our time together on The Circle. Your ability to embrace your crazy, dumb ideas and have fun with each other, and with me, have been perhaps the biggest way we've collectively made a difference here. Look no further to find a difference maker like this than Robbie Trowbridge. I mean, the man has simply never said no to a good time. Late one night this winter, a few of friends of mine were planning a senior sleepover in the schoolhouse. However, it being a random Thursday night in winter term, people began to realize they just had too many tests and papers to work on, and they decided they had to sleep in their dorms. I begged and pleaded, but one by one, they left until I was alone in the library to mourn the loss at a chance for some form bonding, except for the one other occupant of the library, Robbie. I lamented to Robbie in search of sympathy, sympathy for the death of my golden plan, telling him how sad I was that no one wanted to sleep over with me. Put me in, coach, he replied, <laughs> with zero hesitation and a twinkle in his eye. And with no more questions asked, we spent the next, next six hours on the cold, hard floor, sharing our deepest thoughts and fondest grotten memories. When I woke up from our restless four-hour nap, I barely felt the aches in my back and the sleep in my head, as I thought about how grateful I was that Robbie had saved my sleepover, and how much I loved his willingness to ignore our schoolwork for a night and choose idiocy and friendship over knowledge. I couldn't wait to do something dumb with Robbie again. <laughs> Little did I know, but I would get another opportunity just a few months later, when Larry and I set out to build a church. We had realized that that one back there behind you was built all the way back in 1900. And frankly, it shows. <laughs> we just kind of needed something new. But we realized we might need some help. And we thought of our favorite main character, who instantly agreed to take the train down from Cape Elizabeth that same day. In our excitement, however, Larry and I briefly forgot about Robbie. Mistiming our arrival at the air train station and picking him up 
an hour and a half after we told him we would. <laughs> Robbie had not called or texted to complain about our lateness, and we feared for his safety, <laughs> wondering if he was lost on a train somewhere in Connecticut by now. But when we got there, he greeted us with a typical smile, thanking us for picking him up and saying nothing of our arrival time. We apologized profusely anyway, since we felt terrible about our mistake, to which Robbie replied, no, dude, it was such a good opportunity to explore. <laughs> I appreciate your positivity so much, Rob, and everyone else in this forum, since in all of your, your moments like these, when you've put fun above ambition, friendship over scholarship, you've made me proud to be a Groton student and proud to be your friend. I will miss all of your foolishness, fun, and friendship, and I beg you to all continue seeking out the right moments to be an idiot and make a bit of difference by giving light to the lives of others. As we prepare to leave the warm safety of our beach and throw ourselves into a swirling ocean of college, adulthood, and the rest of your lives, I thank you all for being the difference in mine. I love you, every single one of you, even you, Ayush. <laughs> and I wish you the best starting today. Good luck, congratulations, and thank you all so, so much. Back to the traditions of scholarship. <laughs> I'll say a few words. Thank you so much, Will. I'll say a few words about our senior prefects ahead of awarding of, um, of prizes. Amber Stacy Gomera. At our opening chapel, as I began my chapel talk, which I had prepared over the whole summer. I had a terrible case of laryngitis, or COVID, and may I just say, I just did not want to test. So this rendered me voiceless. I looked down and saw that in the first row was seated a newly minted senior prefect. Amber Gumira, hailing from Uganda via Beacon, Bay, Beacon Academy in Boston, I motioned to her to come to the lectern to deliver my remarks. She did this with great aplomb. That would make most current and past presidential hopefuls envious. I started doubting if I had written the remarks. Every year for the last 10, when I delivered the material, Triculation speech, students forget what I said even before they sing the school hymn. This was not the case. Ember was quoted for weeks after she delivered my remarks. <laughs> when I related to graduates who knew her, they were not surprised. They simply said, quote, don't you know her gravitas and presence? Don't you know that we call her Senator? And from then on, I've called her Senator. Amber? Aidan Patrick Haggerty. Thoughtful, versatile, and a conversationalist. That's how many of us view Braden Haggerty. From running roll call with a booming voice 
to helping us decide in short order what kind of prize day speaker we ought to have. Braden is a born leader. Any topic, local or global, he is right there. Well informed. This young man who hails from New Hampshire is quick to share inspiring stories, often about his blue collar working class roots. From the selflessness of his grandfather, who served his country, played college football, and raised his family, to the hard work that his late uncle performed before the World Cup in Qatar. This young man inspired many of us, and they also inspired his peers. His willingness to share his family story inspired this headmaster. At Pala, while others were having cookies and playing ping pong. So, the second Charles Lanier Appleton Prize, after the first one was awarded to the senator, is being awarded to Braden Patrick Haggerty. The Asma Gul Hassan, form of 1993 Circle Voice Journalism Prize, acknowledges outstanding leadership in creating, editing, and producing the school's newspaper. The prize goes to Jun Wang. The Tronic Award is given in honor of Michael G. Tronic and is awarded to members of the sixth form who have made especially good use of the library <laughs> <laughs> and shown a strong interest in the life of the mind. These two sixth formers are Rowan Hilreth and Will Ratus. <laughs> The Butler Prize for Excellence in English is given by Mrs. Gilbert Butler and is awarded to Mei Mitsui. <laughs> the Laura J. Coolidge Form of 1985 Poetry Prize is given in her memory by her husband, Peter Tush to a member of the upper school who has shown a love for the power of poetic expression and a sustained interest in writing and reading poetry. This prize is for Fiona Renan. The Heard Poetry Prize is awarded to Julie Shea. The George Livingston Nichols Prize for the best essay on a historical subject is awarded to Mei Matsui. <laughs> the Perry History Prize is given by Mrs. 
Eliza Endicott Perry to the best scholars in the field of history. This year's two students are Fiona Rinen and Zola Sayers Faye. The Rogers V. Scudder Classics Prize is given in memory of Rogers Scudder, a distinguished teacher of classics at Groton and a beloved member of this community. This prize goes to Colin Kim. The Franklin D. Roosevelt Debating Prize is given in memory of Franklin D. Roosevelt, form of 1900, by W. Averill Harriman, form of 1909. This year's prize is awarded to two students, Rowan Hildreth and Amy Ma. The Endicott Peabody Memorial Prize is given in memory of the Reverend Endicott Peabody by the Sixth Form of 1945 for excellence in the field of religion and ethics. This prize is awarded to Zola Sayers Fay. The Isaac Jackson Memorial Prize is awarded to the best mathematics scholar in the upper school. This prize goes to Larry Lee. The New England Science Teachers Award goes to the student who, through personal initiative, has done the most to promote awareness of science or technology. This year's prize goes to two students, Amy Ma and Sam Winkler. The Thorpe Science Prize is given by Mrs. Warren Thorpe to a member of the sixth form who has been the most successful in developing an appreciation of the spirit and meaning of science. This sixth form former is Yash Agawal. The Bertrand B. Hopkins Environmental Science Prize is given by the form of 1948. It is awarded annually to a student who has demonstrated outstanding achievements in environmental studies. This prize is awarded to Christina Chen. The World Language Prize goes to three students. Tyler Bowden for Spanish, Devon Mastrioni for French, Oliver Orr for Chinese.
The Hudson Music Prize is given by the friends of William Clark Hudson, form of 1956, to show the recognition of outstanding effort and progress in music during the school year. This prize goes to three students, Vivan Das, Benson Hahn, Michelle Kim. The Choir Cup, established in 1915, is awarded annually to the chorister showing greatest improvement in musical growth, in sight reading, and vocal technique. This year's award goes to two choristers, Sam Winkler and Elizabeth Wolfram. The photography prize goes to Jojo Sumasi. <laughs> the upper school shop prize goes to Lindsay Manujian. The Reverend Frederick R. Kellogg Upper School Art Prize is given in his memory in recognition of distinguished work in art. This prize is awarded to Mei Matsui. <laughs> the Anita Andres Roger Sin Dance Prize goes to Janice Darqua. <laughs> the Reginald Fing Junior Medal is given by the sixth form of 1928 in memory of First Lieutenant Reginald Fink, Jr. and is awarded to a member of the sixth form who has shown in athletics qualities of perseverance, courage, and unselfish sportsmanship. This year's honor goes to Larry Lee. The Cornelia Emery Frothingham Athletic Prize is given by her parents and awarded to a member of the sixth form who has demonstrated all around athletic ability and has shown examples, exemplary qualities of leadership and sportsmanship. This prize goes to Karena Beckstein. Yeah. The Elizabeth and Marjorie Peabody Award 
is given to a member of the sixth form other than a school prefect, whose contributions to the community demonstrate a sens sensitivity to and strength of character, leadership, and integrity. This award is for Jaden Adinkra. Yeah. William V. Larkin Form of 1972 Award is given to the Groton student who best exemplifies courage and perseverance in meeting a challenge or overcoming adversity. This prize is awarded to Abigail Hannewell. Final award, the Carol and John King Hodges Prize, is given in memory of Carol Hodges, form of 1905, and John King Hodges, form of 1910, for possessing a common touch and exemplary generosity to others. I would like to honor Jack Leonetti. Thank you, Dr. Reyes, and our beloved registrar, Ms. Cochrane. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, presidential historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author John Mitchum. Mr. Mitchum is one of America's most prominent public intellectuals, our treasure. With a depth of knowledge about politics, history, religion, and current affairs, he has the unique ability to bring historical context to the issues and events impacting our daily lives. The author of several number one New York Times bestsellers, Mr. Mitchum has written acclaimed books about Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, Winston Churchill, George H.W. Bush, civil rights icon John Lewis, and Groton's own Franklin D. Roosevelt, form of 1900, and himself a prize day speaker in 1931 when he was governor of New York, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a fellow of the Society of American Historians. Mr. Mitchum is a distinguished visiting professor at Vanderbilt University, where he holds the Rogers Chair in the American presidency. He is leader's number one New York Times bestseller which I asked Mrs. Makula to get me for Christmas. And there was light. Abraham Lincoln and the American Struggle was published in October 2022. Please join me in welcoming John Mitchum. Thank you, Headmaster. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Headmaster. Um, was it America's most prominent public intellectual? Was that it? That's like little like being described as the best restaurant in a hospital. <laughs> you know, you want to win, but it's not that hard. Um, but thank you. Um, and I was sitting there thinking, you know, this is a grand occasion. That's very kind words. And as the Lord will do sometimes, I, my mind went back to a, a moment 
It's been about 10 years ago, I was on the Washington Mall at the National Book Festival. And I was on my way at that point to give my talk about Andrew Jackson. And a woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough. <laughs> Ever, actually. And if they do, there's usually some kind of medical device involved. But anyway, um, that's my demo. Um, and she said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, well, yes, you know, existentially speaking, that's hard to argue with. And uh, I live in Tennessee, so I have to leave the state to use existential as an adverb. So thank you. Um, yeah, this is good stuff. Y'all can, yeah, this is good. It may not be, wait, it may not be will level, but we're trying. And by the way, what goes on in this library? <laughs> I, I need to work on that. Um, so this woman runs up and she says, oh my God, it's you. She said, I love your books. They've meant so much to me. Will you wait right here? I'm going to go buy your new book and have you sign it. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I stood there thinking, this is the way the world's supposed to be, right? Women are up to you. They buy your book. It was a twofer. Hand to God, she brought back John Grisham's latest <laughs> novel. So, whenever I think I'm America's most prominent anything, I remind myself that somewhere in America, there is a woman with a forged copy of The Runaway Jury, right? I signed the damn thing. Um, and since we're on this topic, I tell you, at that point I was writing a, a book about George Herbert Walker Bush. I know you're, are you allowed to mention an Andover person here? I don't know. Um, uh, and I was on my way at that point to Maine to see the Bushes, and it was the next day. Uh, it took me 17 years to write the Bush book. Uh, it was supposed to be posthumous, but the son of a bitch wouldn't die. Um, I... I'd bring it up, I'd bring it up, he'd say, not going to do it. Um, Y'all didn't get that, we'll explain that later. I had to explain to a student the other day what cut and paste meant. I said, well, you know, you, know, you would cut things and you'd paste them, and she said, oh my God, that's where that came from. Um, anyway, so I was, I was on my way to Maine to see the bushes, I sat down, uh, for some reason it was just us at lunch that day, which was very unusual. Bush world was like a wasp Epcot, right? <laughs> You're wearing those hats. You can laugh. Um, you know, the Oak Ridge boys would be there, Gorbachev, Billy Graham. But for some reason, it was just us. It was just the three of us at lunch that day. And I told this story about being mistaken for John Grisham. And I will confess to you, on this sacred day, it was an entirely transparent attempt to get either the former president or the former first lady to say, oh, you're so much more important than John Grisham, right? So I had cast the fly out on the water, and Barbara Bush looks across the table in that inimitable way of hers and says, well, how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, he's a very handsome man. <laughs> so it was a bad weekend. Um, I'm honored to be here. Again, Headmaster, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt once gave this speech. Now I'm doing it. That may disprove Darwin. Um, but I'll wait. It's good. If you were at Andover, they might have laughed quicker. I don't know. Um, come on, come on. Theodore Roosevelt, as usual, minced no words. You are not entitled he told an earlier graduating form, either in college or afterlife to an ounce of privilege because you have been to Groton. You are rather to be held to an exceptional accountability. Much has been given you, therefore we have a right to expect much from you. So no pressure, guys. <laughs> the world has already turned over many times since you've been in it. Most of you were born about 18 years ago. That was a time when George W. Bush was president. The Apprentice was debuting on NBC. <laughs> That's as close as we're going to get. <laughs> Gas cost $1.69 a gallon. The biggest movie was Shrek 2, which competed against Spider-Man 2, National Treasure, The Bourne Supremacy, 
Anchorman, the legend of Ron Burgundy. And no coordination here, SpongeBob SquarePants, the movie. <laughs> On television, that's, I'll explain to y'all later what that is. Um, CSI, American Idol, Desperate Housewives, Grey's Anatomy, and Everybody Loves Raymond dominated the culture. The Dow Jones Industrial Average when you were born was about 10,000 points. TikTok was something a clock did. <laughs> and the iPhones were about three years from being invented. You were just beginning school when Barack Obama became the first black president in American history. You lived through the deadliest pandemic in a century and watched the first insurrection against the Capitol in the history of the Republic. So you understand history. You've lived through a good bit of it. And there is, I promise, so much more ahead. To be ready for the vicissitudes of the present and the future, it helps, it's not dispositive, but it helps to look back in order to have some sense of where we're going. So what is one larger lesson of the American story? That from Normandy to the rending of the Iron Curtain, from Harriet Tubman to Alice Paul to John Lewis, we have made the American experiment in liberty worth defending. We are at our best selves when we build bridges and not walls, when we lend a hand rather than clenching a fist, and when we act out of generosity and not greed. In those moments, and they are few and sometimes far between, America gets much right. But honesty compels us to acknowledge that we get much wrong. And how could we not? We are a democracy, and a democracy is the sum of its parts, and we, the sinful, the selfish, and the self-satisfied, are those parts. I believe that America has a soul. In Hebrew and in Greek, soul means breath or life. When God breathes life into humankind in Genesis, that word can be translated as soul. When Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends, that word can be translated as soul. It's the essence of who we are. And your souls have been shaped by this place, by its principles and by its people, in hours of instruction and inquiry, of joy and sadness. And your soul, like mine and that of the nations, will always be an arena of contention between the impulses for self and what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. They will be forever in tension. And should those angels win just a couple more than they lose, then we're going to be all right. Because our journey is toward not a perfect union, an impossibility on this side of paradise, but a more perfect one. We are a fallen, frail, and fallible people. Our task is to overcome and seek the light. Now we stand on sacred ground. I too am a child of Episcopal institutions. I am a graduate of the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, founded by uh, one of your former headmaster's ancestors. There may be one or two of you who do not know Sewanee well. <laughs> so I will give you this image. Imagine Downton Abbey and Deliverance put together. <laughs> and there you have it. I am a churchgoer. I keep the feast and I live in hope. And I am convinced that the Anglican tradition, of which Groton is such an important part, has much to offer a world of polarization. Our faith is grounded in humility rather than hubris, in recognizing that in the sufferings of the present time, we can only see through a glass darkly, and that when we fail, as we do daily and even hourly, if you're anything like me, we are not to give up but to get up and try again. 
I don't need to tell you that the test of history awaits you. It's the kind of thing people like me say on an occasion like this. You know that. This test will last through all the length of days. We are living in what may emerge as the maximum hour of danger for American democracy, for the threat comes from within instead of without. Ours is an age of declining trust and growing extremism, the spread of lies for power and for profit, the primacy of that impulse for brute power and a deadly dearth of compassion and neighborliness. The good news, and this is truly good news, is that you are stepping into the breach. You are extraordinary people. You have, as President Roosevelt pointed out, been given so much. You've done so much, but you've been given so much. It is a consoling fact for aging people like me that Groton has prepared you for lives of entrepreneurial and principled citizenship, a devotion to justice and to the pursuit of happiness, not only for yourself, but for your families, your friends, and your neighbors near and far, known and unknown. Such citizenship has led to great change, and great change in America tends to come when engaged and creative people like you decide that the way things are isn't the way they should be, and who then form the dispositions of heart and mind to reflect virtues of fair play and human decency. It doesn't get a hell of a lot more complicated than that. The abolitionists who campaigned against slavery, the suffragists who fought for the ballot, the young who rose up from a segregated South where I grew up to demand that the Jeffersonian assertion of human equality must apply to all and not simply to some. Those are your models. Study them, learn from them, emulate them. And if you do, as Theodore Parker of the state once said, you may bend the arc of a moral universe toward justice. But note this well, the arc of a moral universe does not bend by itself. People must insist that it swerve because the forces of reaction are an inevitable part of the forces of progress. If you remember nothing else besides the shot at will, <laughs> nothing else, be a swerver insist that that arc swerve, and then it may bend. Democracy is the exception in human history, not the rule. We've had a good run. It only succeeds when we choose, and it is a choice, to give as well as to take. And the story of humankind from Eden forward, from the third chapter of Genesis unto this hour, is that we'd rather take than give. Democracy, then, is forever vulnerable. Yet it's also forever possible if we heed the lessons of conscience and of history. And I would submit that conscience and history tell us that the future belongs to those in power and far from it, who insist on giving all of us what Lincoln called an open field and a fair chance. And the way we know the future belongs to those people is because the people in the past who rejoiced in hope and were patient in tribulation were not intrinsically better than us. They were frail and fallen and fallible in the way we are. The remarkable thing about American history, the remarkable thing about human nature is not that we get so much wrong, is that we get just enough right. That's the lesson of history. Now, if this seems overly grand or gauzy, remember, they did it not so long ago. They were flawed but devoted, imperfect but determined, few in number but strong in spirit. And in that history lies our hope. So a final word. Uh, here's my advice to you that's historically based and heartfelt 
from my advancing middle age to your youth. Please, please, please don't let any single cable network or Twitter feed tell you what to think. Do that for yourself. You'll be delighted with the results. Be curious, be gracious, be hopeful. If you're so inclined, say your prayers and seek the means of grace and the hope of glory. Love your neighbor, or try to. Take naps outside on summer afternoons. Read Jane Austen and Anthony Trollope. As, and also as many detective stories as you can. Go to the movies, the actual ones that are in a building. Subscribe to newspapers and magazines. Vote in each and every election. And before you post an opinion online, think twice. Because just because you have the means to post an opinion quickly does not mean you have an opinion worth posting quickly. <laughs> Always put your hand over your heart and join in when the national anthem is played. This is important. Write thank you notes on real paper. It's, you're clear on paper, right? It's the dead tree stuff. Okay. <laughs> Try to look up from the phones. Yes. <laughs> and above all, above all, remember in hours of joy and darkness that Groton has taught you that the test of the ages is not whether you live the good life, but a good life. Godspeed to you. I have my marching orders from our prize day speaker. He said, graduate them. <laughs> so, here we go. Are we ready? Jaden Yeboah Adinkra Cum Laude. Yash Jane Agarwal Summa Cum Laude. <laughs> Karena Faith Beckstein Cum Laude. Avery Cape Benello Magna Cum Laude. <laughs> Zygmunt Hudson Berede Cum Laude. Tyler Charles Bowden, summa cum laude. <laughs> Jesse Christian Buestan, cum laude. Daphne Demarigny Bell Bully.
Elizabeth Lang Burgess Summa Cum Laude. Daniel Henry Burnham, magna cum laude. <laughs> Kaylin O. Cagney, magna cum laude. England, Colin, magna cum laude. <laughs> Christina Tianan Chen, summa cum laude. Lauren Sarah Clark. <laughs> Queen Leon Club, magna cum laude. Janice Mary Darqua Cum Laude. <laughs> Vivan Sendas Summa Cum Laude. Olivia Anike Elizabeth Fayemi, summa cum laude. <laughs> Lawrence Wilhelm August Fritz. Lucas Galatin Gordon, magna cum laude. <laughs> Amber Stacy Gomera, magna cum laude. Georgia Swift Gand Cum Laude. Yeah. 
Reden, Patrick Hagari Cum Laude. Benson August Hijun Han, Magna Cum Laude. Henry Benson Haskell, Summa Cum Laude. Teresa Hastings, Magna Cum Laude. <laughs> Rowan Edward Hildreth, Summa Cum Laude. Robert Jungpo Hong, summa cum laude. <laughs> Alisa Rihanna Hummel, summa cum laude. Abigail Wells Hannawell. <laughs> Alison Shana Candell, Magna Cum Laude. Edward Jackson Kenab, Magna Cum Laude. Ronin Kaplan, Summa Cum Laude. Danielle and Carr. <laughs> Patrick Jerome Kennedy, summa cum laude. Colin Inkyo came summa cum laude.
Michelle Ha Jung Kim Summa Cum Laude. Osric Sean King Jr. Cum Laude. <laughs> Alec Absaroka Konigsberg Summa Cum Laude. Theodore Philip Hume Cocopolis Cum Laude. Paolo Le Duarte Cum Laude. Lawrence Lee Summa Cum Laude. <laughs> Jack Henry Leonetti Magna Cum Laude. Fang Jia Liu Summa Cum Laude. <laughs> Estelle Barbara Lord Cum Laude. Amy Hanjo Ma, summa cum laude. <laughs> Lindsay Rose Manujian, magna cum laude. Dan Ahmed Marinez, cum laude. <laughs> Devon Isabella Mastriani, summa cum laude. May Charlotte Suter Matsui, summa cum laude. Charlotte Marie Maturo.
Kira Nicole Minda Chiriboga, Sum Laude. Anna Catherine Mitchell Cum Laude. Yeah. Oliver Wesson or Summa Cum Laude. Michael William Pelletier, cum laude. Ayush Pillai, summa cum laude. Henry Weldon Pomeroy, cum laude. <laughs> Amelia Arden Portage, cum laude. Clara May Quinlan. <laughs> Fiona Elizabeth Rinen, summa cum laude. Luke James Romano, cum laude. <laughs> Tyler Matthew Santana, magna cum laude. Zola Rose Sayers Fay, summa cum laude. <laughs> Rebecca Baptista Serodio, summa cum laude. Jasper Liu Shama, summa cum laude. <laughs> Rose Mary Shingles, cum laude. Josiah 
Mary Sumansi Cum Laude. Kaden Michael Thomas, cum laude. <laughs> Jack Patrick Travis, magna cum laude. Robert Gilmore Trowbridge, cum laude. Yeah. Donovan Daniel Turk, magna cum laude. Ria Chakovaki, magna cum laude. <laughs> Dylan Thomas Vig. Will Ratos, magna cum laude. <laughs> Francis Catherine Waltz, cum laude. David Wang, summa cum laude. <laughs> Jun Yun Wang, summa cum laude. Samuel Alfred Winkler, magna cum laude. <laughs> Elizabeth Corley Wolfram, summa cum laude. Kifa Murphy Wood, magna cum laude.
Julie Weijie, magna cum laude. Priyana Ya Zhang, magna cum laude. Jining Zhao, summa cum laude. Amy Ying Ying Feng Shui Zhang, summa cum laude. This concludes the formal presentation of diplomas, a celebration of scholarship. Lunch will be served in the adjoining tent. Over there, I hear it's warm, just as warm as it is here. Triumphant form. Handshaking will begin promptly at 1.30 p.m. I implore you to seek positivity the world needs you to do the greater good. Humanity needs you. Go as nucleophiles. The rector, I'm told, and headmasters after him, used to say, six four may go. But then came Mr. Polk, the sixth headmaster, who changed that and used a Zulu phrase that means, that actually is hambakatle. It means, go well.